the first talk we looked at um, the Greek philosophical shift from the philosoph philosophies of the Enlightenment to that of uh, emerging romantic consciousness. We looked at Beethoven's early life in Bonn and what took him to Vienna. And we looked at his early music and its metamorphosis to that of his middle period. And we introduced the concept of absolute music. And that's where we'll pick it up this time. And I wanted to start tonight um, with the notion, and it sounds a little flippant, but this notion of serious music, you know, we all, if we're going to classical concerts, we're serious. We're, go we're going to hear the serious music, and, and you have to listen to it in silence, and you're not allowed to clap in between movements. Is this Beethoven's fault? <laughs> no. I mean, there's a been a lot of serious music. Your, your first comment Beethoven. can't be to disagree with me. That's not going to work. You know. I mean, serious no. music. Yeah. I mean, serious music is music that you take seriously, right? This is the music that you program because you're very serious about music. You know, when the BBC was founded in 1922, they divided music into serious music and to light music. So light music is music that sort of entertains you, the music you can sort of, you can do your ironing to this music, you know, it's sort of like wallpaper music. And it can, it can be classical music. So you could have, you know, Mozart's Eine Kleine Nacht music playing in the background and you're not really listening. So you're not serious about it, it's light. For you. And then there is serious music. This is kind of the, uh, the, the sort of BBC remit to educate you. So this is music that really speaks to you here. And you're supposed to sort of engage intellectually with that music. And that is serious music. Did that not start with Beethoven? Well, well I, because uh, before that, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, we were talking last night about the, the premiere of the Fifth Symphony. So you can go into that a little bit. But this idea of, of going into, into the, the sanctified space, which is our concert space. Right. So that was not the way in the 18th century. No. And did that start with Beethoven? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it didn't. But I think Beethoven, he made it happen. Beethoven is responsible for what eventually happened to the audience. Because Beethoven made serious music really serious. He did. Can we have a picture, a photograph? This is a photograph of Richard. <laughs> Talking R to Beethoven. R Richard's the one on the left. <laughs> where, where, where are you here? Where, where is this? Nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> this is what, Venezuela, did you use it? No. This is uh, Teatro Cologne in Buenos Aires. Oh, okay. In the, in the, lo the lobby, it's a very, uh, for those of you who've been to, to uh, Argentina, this, this concert hall is, was built in the heyday of, of, of Buenos Aires and when uh, it's a, a opulent 3,000 seat, uh, basically it looks like a big opera house. And in the lobby, uh, you walk up the grand staircase and there he is, friendly. <laughs> friendly? <laughs> friendly and loving and smiling. No, he glares at you as you walk up the stairs, basically. This and is an image. This is an image of serious music, right? Oh yeah, look at that. I mean, look, you have, this is, this is what Beethoven's image is actually in the whole of the 19th century. He, he, is, he has no body. It's basically just a giant head because it's, this is intellectual music. And you know, th this is Richard trying to talk to Beethoven, but you don't talk to him. You have to submit to this giant head because Beethoven forces you to submit to his music. You have to take it really, really seriously. And also you notice that he has this heavy forehead and this big scowl. That actually comes from his life mask. Do we have a picture of his life mask? So this is uh, his life mask where uh, he has to scowl because it's really uncomfortable when you put clay on your face and he kind of did this. So he has this kind of crinkly sort of forehead. But we've always misunderstood this to be this kind of very serious Beethovenian look. And so now when people think of Beethoven, they always think of having to listen to his music kind of like this, you know, with that very heavy kind of look. So in a way, what you're confronting there is what happens in the 19th century where you, when you listen to Beethoven, he looms over you with that kind of seriousness, and he's su su supposed to submit to his music. So by the uh, 1840s, so he's, he's dead already, but by the 1840s, people will be listening to Beethoven in silence with their eyes closed like this, with a kind of heavy forehead, you know, listening to that. 
fifth symphony, the seventh symphony. But I think he kind of projected, he was projecting that audience in his music. Far be it for me to con contradict the Beethoven scholar here, but it seems to me that you've just said that Beethoven was responsible for the start of serious music. That kind of very serious, what we call absolute music, yeah, definitely. He We're was gonna get responsible. to absolute music. Yes. And then you mentioned something, yeah, a Wagner quote. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a very, it's a great Wagner quote where you know, he's talking about Mozart symphonies and he says, you know, when I listen to a Mozart symphony, I can still hear this chattering in the background because that's how people would have listened to Mozart symphonies, that people would be chattering. But with a Beethoven symphony, I cannot hear that chattering. It is silent, right? That's what it is. So the Beethoven sort of suppresses that chattering. You need to fully focus. And then if you're going to talk about that, because you, 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 mentioned about, you mentioned about this too then. So what about clapping between movements? Because we talked about one of the late quartets and we talked about the Fifth Symphony. Yeah, I mean. The teleological well, the, yeah, the, motion I mean, of the Fifth, the fifth and, Symphony. And, and, and is, yeah, you can talk about the late quartets. But uh, the Fifth <laughs> Symphony, you, you probably all know it, right? It moves from C minor to C major. So the whole symphony kind of is, is, is a huge trajectory towards victory. Uh, and the third movement to the last movement is, is just joined together, you cannot s separate it. So in a way, he's beginning to think of, uh, of works totally between you know, the whole set of movements become one total organic force. So he's already preventing you between the third and fourth movement from clapping in between. He does this with the sixth symphony too, between movement three, four, and five. You, know, you, you can't clap in between. But he, he, he does an amazing thing with opus 100 and 131 is, yeah. is seven continuous uh, movements played without pause that are uh, um, form-wise are very interlinked from, from the very the opening cell. Everything is it, it's an overriding feature, but there is very little space maybe to clap. There, I guess you could perhaps clap between before the scherzo, after the variations, but most people, I don't think I've ever been either performing in a performance or in a performance where somebody's interrupted the clapping. And quite often, actually, the piece ends after 40 minutes of music and people don't clap because they're sort of shocked. It just sort of bowled them over, this narrative of where he, he form has basically, is subservient. I mean, he basically, it's, it's no longer this pattern with four movements with the, the Sonata Allegro movement, you know, the slow movement, the, the scherzo and the finale. It's, it's, you can't really, there are remnants of it, but it's, it's pretty much gone. And he doesn't write the thick double bar lines, you know, at the end of movements. It's just two thin lines, meaning you just go on. You don't, you don't sort of stop to breathe and clap. That's the idea here. So he's kind of controlling the audience, if you see what I mean. He's kind of projecting. He's sort of trying. Let's put it this way. Instead of the music uh, serving what the audience wants, the music is now forcing the audience to be what it wants it to be. Throughout the first half of the 19th century, we're, we're going to see that progress towards the concert model that's used nowadays. But then tell the story of the premiere of the Fifth Symphony, because it certainly did not happen no, in the not early... In the, in the that's early. why I say it didn't really happen during Beethoven's lifetime, because uh, you know, that, 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 there's a very famous concert uh, in 1808, in December, where it's a four-hour concert. This is the program, the Fifth Symphony, the Sixth Symphony, the G major fourth piano concerto, there's bits of his C major mass. There's the choral fantasy for orchestra and piano and chorus. Which and he wrote for that, that Which he wrote right? for that as a kind of, you know, light ending <laughs> to the evening, that's the idea. And some songs as well. So there was four hours in a freezing cold concert hall. I mean, people would have been kind of chatting in the process. I mean, you couldn't possibly sit through that and be quiet for that long, yeah. So that's it, it's a very different experience now. Right. But this is where our, our notion of serious music comes from. And that's quite different from the idea of absolute music. Yeah, I, I think and, it's and, developed. And you know, the reason I'm asking you that question is apparently you're an authority on this. <laughs> it's a really good book, which you haven't read. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it, absolute music is, it's serious music, but it's also uh, it's instrumental music. So it's the idea that the music doesn't 
uh, serve any other function. It doesn't serve words to help it represent anything. It doesn't serve the church. In other words, it's not to glorify God. It's not to glorify the kings. It doesn't serve the court. It is music in itself. Its very essence, its very notes, its tones, its instrumental music speaks to you. And that is what music is. That is pure music. And that would be the highest form of music, if not the highest form of art in the 19th century. So that's what absolute music is. And this is a romantic phenomenon. This is not necessarily a Beethoven phenomenon. No, it's This it is comes, a romantic phenomenon. Yeah, it really comes out of a development of a new aesthetic, comes uh, through early romanticism. The 18th century instrumental music was regarded as inarticulate. It really needed to have words for it to make sense. In the early 19th century, that same inarticulate nature was regarded as ineffable. It's like it's beyond language. So now you're hearing transcendent stuff, you know, super sensible stuff. That's what it's disclosing to you. So it's the idea that music kind of speaks from beyond almost, beyond uh, the linguistic barriers, that kind of idea. And that is going to then take us to the notion of music's autonomy? Yes, so, so music is now free, it's self-determined. You know, it, it, it means its own thing, right? That's, that's the idea of absolute music. He's smiling at me because he knows where I'm going with this. Because I, I caught him by surprise with this last night. Here's a quote oh, no, here we go. from Daniel Chua. <laughs> the curse of musical autonomy is its meaninglessness. Discuss. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm much more profound on paper <laughs> than I am in person. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, I think the idea here is that really it, it, that, that musical sign is like, a, is like a blank piece of paper, right? It could either mean it's empty or you, it could mean it's totally full. You can read it both ways. So uh, when, when you hear instrumental music, you know, great instrumental music, you know, uh, you could say, yeah, it's ineffable. But you can say, ah, oh, that's really inarticulate. But it also means that you can make it mean whatever you want sometimes. And that's the, that's the danger of it as well in, in the interpretation of that kind of music. Right. And, I, and I, quote, I quoted this was from your book, but um, it, it, uh, this is Scott Burnham. Scott Burnham, another Scott great Burnham. Burnham scholar. Of autonomous music, a tune waving in the winds of our Western world as a blank flag awaiting the colors of a cause. Yeah, so that's the idea that the, 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 the musical work, because it, it has this kind of ineffable or inarticulate, inchoate kind of meaning, that you, you could put all kinds of things on it to mean different things. And of course, Beethoven's music was used for all kinds of purposes. Well, we were talking, we talked about that yesterday over lunch when, when you were talking about Bach, and, and we, we were banding between the term absolute music and complete music. Well, maybe liturgical music had the same benefit as, as music that we're talking about now because maybe it was framed in silence. I mean, I can't imagine you'd be sitting in a sanctuary and gabbing with your friends, you know, when you're celebrating or when you're worshiping God. So maybe Bach would enjoy the same sort of reverence to silence that, that is so integral to listening truly. Because if you're talking, you're not really listening. So. So I was thinking about that, you know, maybe there's similarities. I mean, of course, what Daniel's saying is that music for God is, 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 is for God, and that's what it is. And then maybe, maybe where we're going with this is maybe music of Beethoven starts to, the composer becomes God, perhaps. You know, the music itself becomes God. The music is everything. It's this ineffable, as we, he wrote so beautifully, this orb, this un, this, orb that exists that you can observe, but you, it's impenetrable. And, it, it's, it's, and, it, and it, it exists, and you can interact with it, but it won't interact with you. It's the blank face. And I think this is the sort of the conversion right now, what we're getting into with, with, with instrumental music. We also mentioned last night, instrumentalists themselves in the 18th century were viewed as lower class citizens. They were, they, were, they were servants, either to their patrons or to court or something. That was their job. And this whole conversion of the instrumentalist becoming heroic. I mean, you think of later in the century when people like Liszt, and I mean, the celebration of the individual, I think this is also another shift. And Beethoven himself was a great 
performer. I mean, he was. Well, a, let, let's hold on to that thought because we will come back to that thought. And, you, and, you, and the, there was the first use of the term heroic this evening. Mark that down. Seven nineteen. Mm. Richard O'Neill. Okay. But if we go, if we go to the music of Bach. Uh, if we compare Bach to Beethoven, isn't 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 the the glory to God in Bach? Isn't it, or isn't isn't the 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 affect of Bach in the form? Isn't it the beauty of the form? Isn't that what you appreciate as opposed to in Beethoven? Aren't we now talking about the expression of of self, of I? This becomes a slippery slope of of. Looking back, we, we, we assign different things because of where we are right now, and tradition is all, we, we, we build upon what came before us. But um, sometimes the question is for me is like, does it matter you know, if Bach was writing for God? Was Beethoven writing for himself or his own, his own um, uh, what do you call it, when somebody survives after they're long dead, um, their, their greatness? The, the legacy, there's, a, there's another word, and so forgive me for forgetting. But it, as a concert or today, right. yes, I mean, we could talk about things like this, but I mean, and there was very controversial. Did you read this article in the New York Times about, about the, the Brandenburgs, how they can't escape um, religion? It was a very oh right about social meaning yeah yeah social yeah. meaning and this is, and I kind of read this article and it was basically arguing that even if Bach wasn't writing for for God it was for God and it, it brought all these specific examples of recycled movements like the second concerto how it has it's from like a lot of his music's from the cantatas you know there's all, often those references and and I read the article and I I, I learned a lot but at the end of it I'm like hmm, I don't know. I think there was a big change, though, I think, between the 18th and 19th century, where uh, certainly in, in Germany, well, in German-speaking lands, I mean, there was a huge shift towards, as you said, the, sort of indiv the individual, the heroic individual. Uh, I think in the last session, you must have dealt with Kant and Hegel and all that bunch of people, right? So that's really, all, all ah, the, all the experts now. So basically, that, that, that is a, a philosophy based on the idea of a, sub, of a subject, that is a person, an individual, who is no longer just in the world, but somehow you can manipulate the world, you can control the world, you can shape history. I mean, that's the heroic idea. So that's the heroic subject. So that does come into absolute music because uh, the heroic subject is self-determined, but also uh, the idea of music speaking on its own terms is also a kind of self-determined idea. So that's, I would say there is a big shift between, say, Bach, uh, and, and Beethoven. But on the other hand, uh, what, you, what you mentioned about this silence in the church, right? I think what happened is that that silence got transferred to the concert hall. So you can actually do the same with Bach. You could just bring Bach into the concert hall as well, and you can treat his music in that very decontextualized w w way, and it will still work. It's the, you must remember the 19th century was the age of the museum. So you could put any object into that space, and you could just admire it for its own sake, and it would work. We're going to talk about the late quartets. That's, that's, our, that's where we're heading tonight. And to, do, to, to talk about the late style of the late quartets, we have to, I think we have to firmly establish what the middle style is. And if we're going to talk about that, we're going to talk about absolute music, we're going to talk about musical autonomy, and we're going to have to talk about Eroica Symphony. The hero. The hero. Yeah. And here's another quote. And um, it's a quote of a quote, so you're only half responsible. Beethoven's contribution was to thematize this process so that his music was not merely the medium of autonomy, but its narrative. He programmed the absolute into his works. Hence, A.B. Marx could claim that Beethoven brought to fulfillment the first real autonomous freestanding artwork. I'm talking about the Eroica Symphony. Right. So A.B. Marx is an early critic, sort of writing uh, from the 18, sort of 20, late 1820s onwards. And so maybe I can, we can show the picture of um, the, the portrait of Beethoven, the famous portrait of Beethoven. Um, this is by uh, Willibrod Joseph Mailer. Mailer actually means painter, so this is a very suitable name for a painter. And so this is uh, 
uh, a painting of Beethoven uh, finished in 1804, but Mailer actually met Beethoven in 1802. He was introduced to him, and, he, and when he went into the, Beethoven's house, Beethoven was playing the piano and, and composing the Eroica Symphony. And this would be the perfect portrait for the Eroica Symphony. Because what Beethoven's wearing, in fact, his style is the revolutionary heroic style that uh, came in with the French Revolution. I think this is probably the first um, painting of a famous composer where the composer isn't wearing one of those you know, wigs kind of thing and not wearing the frock coat and the stockings, that very effeminate kind of 18th century style. This is the sort of cutting edge heroic style. We know this because uh, this is actually a very famous hairstyle uh, of, that cent of that time called the hairstyle uh, a la Titus, invented by David the painter. And it's um, a hairstyle modeled on uh, a chap called uh, Brutus, who was the uh, first Roman consul. Very, very short cropped hair. Uh, and Napoleon also had this haircut. That's why it's very uh, revolutionary. So Calcioni said, you know, Beethoven, he's got this new haircut, this haircut other Titus, you know, but it looked a little bit shaggy on him. So anyway, that's, that's Beethoven's haircut. And then he also uh, has this hand gesture, which is a kind of Roman salute as well. And he's holding a lyre here. So he is, as it were, this uh, heroic Orpheus figure holding the lyre. And I, in, the, in this uh, distant uh, space here is the temple of Apollo. So this is the god of the arts, of music, transmitting right, music to Beethoven, and it's sort of echoing, I guess, uh, through the, his, uh, his, his, his lyre. So this is a heroic image of Beethoven. Oh, and these are, are freedom trees in the background. So these are freedom trees behind his hand. So this is about Beethoven the hero. And this really represents what the Eroica is about. Because the Eroica Symphony is always the epitome of absolute music because its a form, particularly the first movement, is almost kind of perfect in you know, making everything work out formally. But at the same time, it's not really a piece of absolute music because it has a title. It's the Eroica Symphony. It's about the hero. And do you know the Eroica, the, the kind of story behind it? You know, he, Beethoven dedicated it to Napoleon, and then Napoleon you know, declared himself emperor. So Beethoven kind of crossed it out. So there's a massive kind of hole at the top of the front page. And then, uh, in fact, he, he actually put the name back down at the bottom in pencil later, but that's another story. And, and so you know, Wagner said, well, you know, it's not really about Napoleon. It's not really about a hero, it's about heroism itself, right? And the hero is precisely autonomous music because the hero is the autonomous individual, the self-determined person that tries to form uh, uh, his, the history. And this is the same with the Eroica Symphony. It's an autonomous work and the hero helps make that sense of greatness into that work. You know, it, basically, they, Beethoven is declaring, I am great, I am hero, I am the legend already here in the symphony. But the form does that and the program does it at the same time. I think that's what I'm trying to say. He kind of programmed that absolute idea of freedom into his own music. So you receive the Eroica symphony as if it is free, as if it is an autonomous, self-standing work, as A.B. Marx put it. I do have to call you on something here because you're, you're banding around the term hero with alarming frequency. Which term? Hero oh, and heroic. Yes. yes. And we talked about this yesterday. And I have to quote, oh, Daniel Chua. Again. <laughs> if anything, recent studies have tacitly embraced this figure by updating his name from Beethoven Prometheus, so there's an opening for you, to Beethoven Hero. The hero is simply another term for a combination of fate and freedom that Prometheus represents. Indeed, not only is Prometheus alive today under this alias, he's been formally installed as a scholarly fixture. The last three decades have witnessed the institution of what was always a latent prejudice in the liter literature in the middle period works. The heroic has escalated from a piece, the heroic symphony, to a phase, and has now even become a period replete with two distinct styles. Yes, unfortunately, the last few decades of Beethoven scholarship, we have uh, renamed the middle period the heroic period. We don't like this, right? We think it's a big mistake because, mm. yes. actually, how many heroic works are there, really? I mean, Beethoven did a well, lot more. Well, hold on to that more. before you go because yeah. what I want to ask uh, about this middle period then. So we, in terms of the string quartets, um, the Calders are going to play the, 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 the late quartet. 
um, we, we've already presented Opus 18 number two. And then next season we're doing Opus 74. And then you've got a lot of experience with Opus 59. So, and when I hear Opus 59, I hear this the, 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 the very clearly middle period style. But you don't think of that as a heroic. Confronting what, what he did at the time, because we were, the Heiligenstadt Testament is around this period where he, this un, undelivered letter was to his, was his brothers, right? Where he basically, he basically confronts his deafness and, and contemplates killing himself and doesn't obviously. And, and, and the famous quote is, it's like, I will, I'll die for. Uh, he, he has the same sort of heroic, sort of stoic kind of uh, quote where he says that he will, instead of killing himself, he will sacrifice uh, his life to his art. Yeah. Basically, he will, he will die for art. That, to this day, probably, people would define as heroic. And I think a lot of people assign that sort of, I mean, for fun, just Google the late period, uh, the middle period of Beethoven and start around the late 50s and go, just go chronologically and you'll see all of your favorites there, all oh, the Fifth Symphony, the Fourth Piano Concerto, the Fifth Piano Concerto, the Ghost Trio. I mean, all of these amazing works that just one after the other. And I think a lot of times people look at that and think, wow, that it's like, it's, and the music becomes, um, it, 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 it's arguably, you know, if, if things were in the Opus 18 quartets were, were more like Haydn, more classically structured, it's like the music is on steroids and the mo motivic, motivic shapes become simpler and the, the hubris in which they're conceived, like the length of the phrases and, and the, the boldness of the music just explodes. And, it, and you go from having, let's say, like seven, eight minute exposition movement, uh, first movements to like 15 minute movements. So 59-1, the F major Razumovsky quartet written for the, the ambassador from Russia who, pay, uh, who paid him to do three quartets. Um, first movement's 15 minutes long. Second movement, a scherzo, 15 minutes long. That's half an hour of music right there, and just that's the halfway point. So I think just in time, time alone, you see that there's a shift. Um, and that is indeed, if I were to choose an adjective, heroic. Um, but as Daniel says, would you consider the fourth piano concerto heroic? Opus 74 heroic? Um, Pastoral symphony. Pastoral symphony, all the even-numbered symphonies from the time. We look at the odd-numbered symphonies, and yes, in, in earlier times that were not as politically correct, they were defined as the masculine symphonies, and then now and the even-numbered symphonies were feminine, and that's no longer, of course, used. I think that's a gross oversimplification. But, I mean, fourth symphony, fourth piano concerto, do you, I don't consider those really... Heroic? Um, yeah, no. In fact, there are, there are very few specifically heroic works here, so it's become this kind of term. But you can see why we use the term in the reception, because, as you say, you know, with, with his deafness and his struggle, we see Beethoven as himself a heroic figure. And uh, Prometheus, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about Prometheus in that quote. I mean, uh, Beethoven is always uh, identified with Prometheus. He's the titan who stole fire from the gods, and then he was punished by being chained to a rock, and an eagle will eat his liver, which would regenerate, and then the eagle will come back the next day and eat his liver again. That was his punishment, right? So he really had to suffer for stealing fire. And that's the image of Beethoven, the deaf Beethoven has to suffer for his art. So if you go to um, Beethoven, I think you're going to Beethoven Platz in Vienna on your tour. We you are. will see this giant statue of Beethoven, and he, on, at the base, there are two sort of uh, mythological figures. One is Nike, saying, you know, do it, and then on the <laughs> and the other side oh, is Prometheus, and it's Prometheus tied to a rock with his liver being eaten by this eagle. So this is really the image of Beethoven that we all have because of his life, and so we project that onto all his music. So that heroism, right, is always is there, and so that's why they want to call that middle period heroic. But music. but I'm but it really isn't. But, but I'm also hearing I'm hearing two sides because. You, sir, have used the term heroic with alarming frequency when, when you, yeah. in the early part. So it's there. It's just definitely there. But you can't can have it both ways. So yeah, I, I, I can. All right. <laughs> because it, it's there. I mean, it is absolutely. It's the whole reception of Beethoven is a heroic 
reception of Beethoven. But isn't also the isn't also the heroism in in the philosophy of the the period? Isn't isn't the notion of the emergence of self? Isn't that a personal struggle as yes, well? Yes, correct. So can and not even Beethoven. Let's let's, let's forget, forget it. Let's forget about deafness and just just the, the idea of self awareness. Isn't that going to be a remarkably frightening thing when it first comes along? Yes, I mean, I think the 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 well, I mean, you can't escape this French Revolution, and that's the whole. Uh, that, that's really the beginning of the idea of the heroic. But the, in German philosophy, I mean, the Kantian subject, Kant, I mean, that's basically the dutiful heroic subject, you know, morally speaking. And you, uh, you, 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 you will the world in a sense, uh, morally will the world. So in a way, we're talking about um, autonomy in terms of the will. Right, this movement of the will that's there. So yes, you're right. I mean, the, the idea of the heroic self is built in to the, the, the concept to, to of the To everything self. of that. Yes, of that period, century, because right? nobody could escape the, the consequence of the French Revolution. Right. Another quote. Adorno, the command to kill echoes within Beethoven's music. Chua, in these pieces, Beethoven's language undergoes a self-searching progress towards an abstraction that forces the emotional and technical content of the music to break down in violence. And repeatedly in this fascinating book, this, this was um, a chapter that, a section in a chapter that, that blew my mind, the, the notion of violence in Beethoven's music. You don't agree with this, right? <laughs> but yeah, you want, to, you, want, you want to speak on this first? Because it's quite shocking, really, to think of Beethoven as a very violent composer. You, I'll, I'll begin. Oh, no, right. Right. Well, no, because we know what he's going to do. So, no, I don't, actually. You don't? I'm, I'm, I'm okay, curious. I'll, I'll do my thing. Sleeping through I'll do my night. thing. All right, so we have this picture of... of um, but before you, yes. before you oh. do that, the other thought of, of, of Beethoven and the emergence of self in, in the, the philosophy of that time, it's always going to be a masculine emergence, right? Yes. It's, it's always male in yes. that politically incorrect time. So the male hero, and the male hero is always going to be violent. Yes. Right? Because the hero basically, the, the, the hero is, is based on kind of uh, sort of the, the, the Roman past, basically, is that very stoic hero. So you always align your life basically with sacrifice. You will eventually sacrifice your life to, to, you know, to, to save everyone else. Uh, so it's a kind of, you choose that path. So it is a very violent path uh, in that sense. Yes, it's true. But it's also the idea that you make your own history. Right? It's a revolutionary idea. Right? We, we will make the future. Uh, that's, that's basically And then that. the other notion of, we, we, we talked about uh, the, 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 the environment in which Beethoven grew up. We, we, we talked about the, 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 the French Enlightenment and, and the revolution. And the revolution, the notion of, of liberty and, 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 and equality and fraternity. But the instrument of the revolution was the guillotine. Yes, it's a very efficient way of, <laughs> of giving you an aristocratic death. <laughs> and then Beethoven's er, early life was with, with Napoleon, the Napoleonic Wars, which, which means you're going to be seeing the debris of, of, the, of, of, the, of war coming through your streets and wounded soldiers and death and dead and, and funerals. And then Vienna's overrun, and you have the Metternich. Era, uh, the, after, of, after 1815. So his complete yes. life is a life of violence. There's, there's a lot of uh, changes going on in that time. It's a time of great political upheaval. That is for sure, because you had the French Revolution, followed by the Terror, followed by Napoleon, followed by the Congress of Vienna, followed by you know, Metternich. So it's like, you know, it's a lot happening um, at once, really, to Beethoven. Do we want a picture? Yeah, let's go to do the, the picture, because you want, so, well, we can do the horse later. Well, which we can, one do you want? I want, um, uh, this was fine. Any of these, these ones Brutus? here? Yeah, this was fine. Because, um, this was, I was talking about how that, that painting of Beethoven is really based on the kind of French style. So the 18th century was really an age of sensibility, you know, it was sense and sensibility. And if you 
listen to string quartets, you know, Haydn's string quartets, Mozart's string quartets. Uh, Goethe said, you know, these are four intelligent people conversing as an age of conversation. It was actually an aesthetic of feeling. People were very touchy-feely. Uh, and then the French Revolution came and the model changed. It was a different style. And it was based on, on this guy here, who is called um, Brutus, uh, I think it's Lucius Junius Brutus, not the Brutus who killed Caesar, but the first uh, Republican consul in Rome. And, and the idea here is you have a, a heroic figure that is so principled, so stoic, that they, they, they would keep to that principle, even if it means that your own children, your sons, would need to be executed in, in order to secure the Republic. So this is what this painting is about. And this is by uh, David, the same guy who invented Beethoven's haircut. Uh, and it was painted in 1789 in the year of the French Revolution. So this would have been exhibited during that time. It's basically saying that you should be like this and not like this. This is the men-women thing, right? Where these women are just, you know, they're, they're overcome with emotion. And that's not what you should have. That's the old aesthetic. We could have another. If there's so many paintings of, Which one? Uh, by David. It doesn't matter. Whatever one comes up next. And this is... So this is Socrates, um, also about to die. Um, so the, he's drink, about to take it, uh, the, 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 his punishment, the, the cup of poison. And you can see, again, his figure is impenetrable. His body, I mean, it's almost, he almost has a six-pack. You know? He's upright, he's erect, he's pointing. There's a greater truth up there that I'm dying for. And you can see all the other people here are just swooning you know, like, like this. And that's the kind of old aesthetic. But the, this is the new thing. You should be like Socrates. That's the idea here. Um, and this is the uh, oath of the Horatii. And these are the brothers swearing an oath together. And as you can see, again, the women are here like this, you know, like, you know. Um, but the, the men, just, they, they are formal. They are architectural. They're angular. You can see that there's absolutely no fat, you know, in their body. It's just pure muscle. And the interesting thing about all these figures are that they're absolutely still. It's just as if history cannot move them. They move history. History does that situation does not control them. So that really is the idea of the heroism behind uh, the Beethoven hero. That's what's going on here. So if we're talking about violence, you can see that um, violence really is at the heart of the hero. It is a kind of sublimation, if you like, of that revolutionary hero, that impenetrable stuff. And this is, of course, another famous painting by David, this Napoleon riding his horse here. And again, you know, he's not, he, it's a heroic pose, right? He has the, you know, a statuesque body, and he's, you know, got that, <laughs> he's got that haircut on the Titus there. Um, and, you know, the wind is blowing, everything's moving, he's going up the Alps, but he can do that pose because he is unmoved by all this stuff because he will move the world, he will control history. That's the kind of idea here behind this kind of heroism. So when, we, when I'm talking here about violence in the music, in the eroica, you know, when, he did, when Beethoven described the symphony in the, pub, uh, the London publication, he says, this is about the death of a hero. It's exactly the same thing. So he's composing a piece where the form itself has no fat. You know, this is pure, muscular, formal, architectural music, right? This is non-sentimental stuff. This is the hero. Beethoven's <laughs> forms are so pure, they are virtually blank, a totality of nothing. But to achieve this state, everything unnecessary has to be violently purged. The controlled violence of Beethoven's style, writes Rosen, <clears throat> comes from his ability to cut away anything superfluous from the structure of the musical language and then demonstrate what power it has when it functions unimpeded by the restraints of decorum. Beethoven's freedom is brutally structural in its asceticism and its formal purity violently exclusive. And Adorno says, the purer the form and the higher the autonomy of the works, the more cruel they are. There we go. So that's why Adorno could say he could hear the command to kill. I mean, it's not that this music is, you know, telling you to kill anybody, but it's a kind of displaced aggression that's going on here. And Adorno is saying, you know, if you stand far back enough and really listen to this, there is an inherent violence in this kind of music. I mean, it's about form. It's not that it's, you know, chaotic violence. It is formal, coercive violence that's going on to make the music what it is. But, but we've been talking about how he, you were talking about this yesterday, about how he, he, 
he reduces the form. So the non-fat Beethoven. Well, think of, well, dum, bum, 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 da, 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 da. Where's that from? Last moment of Aroca. So, I mean, talking about pairing, I mean, I think, jump ahead to the Ninth Symphony. What happens in the, the climax of the Ninth Symphony in the last movement, the choral movement? Bump. <laughs> Bump. But, 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 but he reduces it down to a single little, little contra. Is it the, the bassoon, the, the B flat? It's just let's go back to the 1770s, 1780s to Haydn and Mozart. Wow. I mean, if they, I mean, there are moments of minimalism or taking taking things down, reducing it down to the basic elements, which I guess in this is violently getting rid of all the fat. I think Beethoven. He takes it to another level. I mean, there's just there's nothing superfluous. It's just it's so essential. It's just it's to me. I, I, that's I think maybe why why there has been some reticence for me to, to assign violence to it. I think it's just it's like a lot of the greatest things that have survived time. It's it's just so essential. There's nothing. It, it, nothing needs to be changed because there's nothing that's, that's wasteful. It's just so. It, it's and the use of silence. Your gauntlet. It's gone through the gauntlet of, of reduction. You know, of, and as we know, most compositions don't suffer from being too short. I think there's, I, I don't know many compositions that are too short. Usually the criticism with composition, it's too long. There's, there's not enough paring down. But with Beethoven, I mean, can we, and that, that process for him was not a, a pretty little Mozartian exercise yeah, where, where we're like, you know, like where you look at Mozart manuscripts and you can see like the, the ink is almost still wet to this day because it's just like things don't even line up. You can see in the quartet's first violin, bass, the, the bass, the cello, the first violin and the second violin viola like just throws in because it's already done. With Beethoven, I mean, physically you can look at the, the manuscripts. I mean, he, he struggled. He, it was not this easy process of just like, oh, I woke up one day and I wrote this piece and it was done. No, he, he, he I think he, he was, it's brutal. So I guess, yes, it is. It's, it's it, works, it's, it's very it, easy. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not a pleasant process, I don't think. And probably he wasn't the most pleasant of people either. But that simplicity, that the, the reduction allows him to create these giant structures actually. So you know, simple things like, you know, da, 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 right, can become massive structures. Well, they're just the beginning of the Eroica. It's just a triad. And he sort of makes it into this thing. But, in fact, it's he, also the use of silence. Because every, everything, you, everything that you're citing as an example is followed by rest. silence. Yeah. Yes, that's right. I mean, the silence is very important. But it's a very full silence. Right. Yes. That's the key thing. Have we? Establish the music of the middle period for you? Do, you? do you feel that we've done middle? I think we've done middle. Let's go to late. I think Daniel and I share a, a common ally that we both came to the late quartets at a, a, a sort of Early. almost pre-puberty. It was like, like 11, 12. Yes, pre-pubescent yeah, experiences. It was sort of the innocent yet. time. I was introduced at a music festival to, I was assigned Opus 132. Um, which uh, now I look back, it's like, well, that, that's, that's bold. But um, I, I learned 132 at that age, and, I, and I, it was such a, a gift because the language has been around. It. I was at a talk the other night about Ulysses. And um, the, 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 the speaker referred to Ulysses as the most influential book that people haven't read. <laughs> And I, I'd actually thought that was uh, waiting for Godot. So in, in one of the in introductions for the next concert, I, I cite waiting for Godot as the most influential play that people have never seen. Um, and to an extent, our next program is Opus 127 and, and, and the Concord Sonata by Ives. And both those works, I think, suffer the same negative mythology that they're impenetrable and unapproachable. And so I think you're your example of, of this 12-year-old boy just playing 132 is, is one of the things that we have to overcome as presenters and performers, right? We always think of it as difficult. And some of it is actually difficult. But actually, a lot of it 
isn't difficult. I remember, in fact, listening to 127. The first, that's the first late quartet I heard. I just thought it was the most perfect music ever written. I couldn't believe that anybody could write this kind of stuff. I thought, this is unbelievable. And then you, know, you discover that all the other late quartets, and there's just more and more, and none of it is bad. It's just all so perfect. And actually, a lot of this music is very accessible. There's a very famous quote by George Bernard Shaw where he says, you know, all these middle period quartets, you know, all the intellectual and profound stuff that happens there, I much prefer the late quartets because they're much simpler. They're sort of not so intellectual. They're sort of perfectly intelligible. And because actually, if you listen to them, there are lots of nice tunes in there. And there are lots of uh, what Joseph Kerman calls lots of ditties, lots of things that you could almost whistle. Do you want to? Play a little bit I, of this. I, I saw you we could play the so. yeah. We okay. could play uh, that one thirty uh, uh, s s scherzo. <laughs> Not difficult. So this, by the way, this is the Annis Quartet, for, uh, and, and Richard is the violist. In it. So all the examples we're playing are from a television broadcast? This is the, uh, it's let's a cycle do a little back, the, background to this. Three, three years ago, we did the entire cycle in the Budapest Honor, which repeats 130. So it's six concerts of, of, of the quartets. We did over two weekends. Yeah. In Korea? In Korea. I'm just saying it's, it's very, I mean, it's very accessible. And a lot of the music actually is extremely accessible, although he will often just do that one little thing to, you know, to just to put a little twist in that. I and mean, it will come in this piece later. Uh, so, you, you know, you always sort of like, a, there is a jolt at some point, but it's very, uh, it, it's not as difficult as you think. So I'd always encourage people, just listen to it. It's not like it's such sacred ground that you cannot walk upon well, it. Well, it's, it's also the fact that this is you know, 2019. So, I mean, the mythology did have, uh, the reputation did have a certain foundation in Beethoven's time, did it not? In the 19th century, uh, a lot of people thought that uh, these works were not difficult, but just mad. Uh, in fact, the, the first time, the, the, the early period, when, I mean, when they began, began to assign different periods to Beethoven, the third period, the late period, was used really to, to, cite, you know, to sort of cut these works off. Don't listen to these ones, because he went crazy at this time, right? So just listen to the middle period ones. But after a while, people kind of got, got hold of the, the, the late style as you know, the most amazing But, it, but it was after a while. It was many, after because a while. Because it was... It was Decades, it was, right? Yeah, it was after a while. So, so it, it had the reputation of... Yes. It was only the, the cognoscenti, so Schubert loved Schubert, Mendelssohn... And Schumann. Schumann. They, yeah. they, they got it. So, so in a way, as I, I said earlier, Beethoven was trying to project an, an ideal audience. So when he's writing these late quartets, he's imagining a future audience. And he had a really good audience for these performances in his lifetime. He had a very small select group. And he would even have the quartets played twice if they would understand it. But um, at some point, I mean, definitely, we'll maybe we'll talk about this later with the Grosse Fuga. I mean, they, they couldn't understand that work at all. They, they, they persuaded him to remove it, in fact, from that particular quartet. Um, Who's the, they? Uh, the audience. It was the or not the publisher. Uh, well, and well, they, he, because Beethoven didn't didn't always listen. Right? In fact, it's very unusual for him to say, "Ah, oh, maybe you guys are right." Yeah, it didn't go down well at all. So th he was persuaded by his colleagues that maybe you know really you know, maybe that's not the right piece. You should write another finale for this particular quartet. So th th there is a level of difficulty in that sense. But now. After Schoenberg and Stravinsky, this music is not difficult. There is nothing here that I think that is so challenging that you can't get. In fact, you know, Stravinsky said of the Grosse Fuga, I think it's probably the most difficult uh, piece here. You know, it's my favorite. It's just pure interval music. This is, you know, it will never, it's, you know, it will always be contemporary, that kind of, kind of comment. So in a way, um, that future audience is kind of already here. And I think you're kind of building that kind of audience in, in the Camerata, right? So it's, it's all very accessible <laughs> to you. The reason we're having these talks is the, the, the reason you're here. The deeper you want to go, the greater the reward will be. But you can come along 
to any of these, these quartets and you're going to hear a beautiful, well-constructed piece of 19th century music. You know, I think there's something about, we're talking about silence in the music, but there's, some, there's something about being locked inside his own, his own head and not being able to really, because this, this myth that he couldn't hear um, for a large period, he actually could hear for a while. I mean, it wasn't just like all of a sudden gone. It was a, in a way that's probably harder in some ways. But near the end, when a lot of basically the Galitzin quartets are basically written in, he couldn't really hear by that point, right? No, he, he was stone deaf. He was stone deaf by that point. And Daniel has some very interesting things because you just heard 111, um, this last concert set. But with the obsession with trills is like, Daniel has this very interesting thing about, maybe you should explain this, you, you speak about this so Well, because you know, he, he, con he continued to you know, compose at the piano, which is a bit weird if you can't hear anything. Um, but I think what, what's going on in Beethoven is he, you know, he wants to bathe himself in a kind of resonance. So when he's you know, at the piano and he's playing this, you know, you write the top register and the lower register, you're doing this, you're kind of creating all these resonances and vibrations. So his whole body has become his ear as it were, and he's really listening that way. And I think a lot of the times in these late quarters, he wants you to be immersed in the kind of baptism of resonance or this kind of uh, ringing sound that's going on here. Well, I can imagine, you know, like the trill is, is, so, not a, is so not an ornament in Beethoven ever, but, no. but, but I mean, to think about Beethoven's body just became one big trill, <laughs> you know, to think about like 109, the last movement of 109, which has that trill baby trill thing, you know, and hammer clavier where things break, tri break through. actually hammer clavier is where trill baby trill comes from, the Jeremy Dayton quote. But these, this obsession with trilling, I mean, trill, I, and I mean, 111. Right? 11, yes. yeah, which, which, which is a little bit of a different trilling because I think you go to heaven with the trilling. But to think about what he was trying to do and, and what that, I guess I will reuse the word gauntlet, or what that, that burden of not hearing and not having the physical sound at your disposal and what that allowed him to accomplish in these late quartets. And, but how, and because we, we mentioned this, how does, how does that affect you as the practitioner? As, as, a, as a string player practitioner, I'm always reminded of the famous quote to Schaponzig's, like, who he, he lovingly called, you know, you, you fat cow. You know, uh, among the other things is like, do, do you think I care about your wretched fiddle when the spirit moves me? You know, so I think a lot of that, a lot of times when I'm like struggling, it's like, I guess he wouldn't care if he was alive and he's listening to me right now. But, but there's some things in the late quartets, especially in the inner writing, that's, you know, that it's really, really, there's so much going on in the temples that he actually doesn't, he's kind enough to not <laughs> give us these metronome markings like a lot of the, the redacted things where he wrote metronome markings which are really, really challenging and I have a theory about that. Like if you were, if you listen on headphones sometimes to things and the, the ear source is right here, you have a different sense of metronome markings. If I were writing metronome markings even in the hall like this and somebody's sitting in the back, or let's say we go into the Granada, somebody's sitting in the balcony, it takes time for, sounds pretty slow. So a lot of times I think for him, you know, to think about conceiving music that's really of the mind and it's never allowed to, to blossom, to ring, like what I get to experience every day, that gift, that, that breaks my heart sometimes to think that I'm basically experiencing his music that he never really, he was doing all the stuff to try to get, but he, he couldn't enjoy it himself. You know there's, I mean? so, there's also, you, you were talking about, and, and, and the idea of the, the immediacy of the sound in that musical imagination, but, but, but you have to, the, the it's phrase funny. you used was the torque, and I, I thought that was Well, this, is, this, 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 this also goes to like, I always think that Beethoven's nicer to the violist because he played the viola. That's how he made his early start in Bonn as, as a member of the orchestra. So like where the cello, the cellists are punished greatly. Cellists, cellists have, you probably heard Ani play the, the triple concerto a few weeks ago at the Santa Barbara. I don't know what he had with cellists, but he really gives them like, he give, they live like at the extremities. And the violinists, as you'll see in a lot of late quartets, the violinists have, have these really, really technically challenging things like the, the scherzo in 135, but the violin is just, it's, you're literally jumping octaves between at speed and with slurs. You're supposed to slur, but most people cheat because it's really hard. In this movement too, these, these, these sort of arpeggios are very hard. 
so much is going on in the, it takes time to move your, your arm. And so you're moving along and this, you're, you're getting all this torque. It's like, and you're sort of like, your body is sort of like, it's hard to not just like, I don't know, fail <laughs> to hit all the notes. I, I find that beautiful and sad and wonderful at the same time that, that, that as, he, as, he's, as he's conceiving of this in his head, there's just, there's no, there's no consideration for it the fact that you have to move your arm for it. And Bach had the same reputation for that too, right? Bach didn't care about the... I'm not, not sure, but Bach, you know, Bach, didn't Bach, 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 yeah, I mean... <laughs> but he, he, didn't care, he didn't care about how difficult the, the music he was... Really Leave it to sure. violas, I tell you. Yeah. You know, violas, that's a dangerous <laughs> wager. But um, I don't think... Yeah, maybe, maybe you know, that was an earlier comment about the wretched fiddle, but, you know, I mean, I think we... Because he did what... He, he gave us the gift you know, the least we can do is strive to achieve his vision, you know, and whatever people criticize, these works are really, are, are they're just the best. They're the so best. your experience of presenting these works as a cycle? I, uh, I have this chamber music project in Korea that it's now finishing up after 13 years, but I, I, I expressly made this project, which was to reach out to non-classical audiences to bring them in, a lot of kids, a lot of teenagers um, uh, with, with, with chamber music. Um, because I really wanted, as ever since I was a child, there was a poster of the Beethoven cycle um, in this studio where I was learning 132, and I would look at that, and I'd see all the quartets, and I'd memorize the order, and I was like, someday I'm gonna do that. And so I realized that, you know, and of course, as you get to know the quartets, you realize each one is their, their, their own world and they're each great worlds to get by themselves, but together it really gives you basically a complete picture of this, the, the journey of one of the greatest, the, probably perhaps the greatest journey of progress of any composer to think of where he started and where he ended. I, I mean, it's incredibly moving, but maybe I think if I were to choose, we ended the cycle with uh, the Heiliger Dankesang, the holy saying, song of thanksgiving written by an invalid to God, right? To the God, to the, the God, to the God, the God head, head. Um, in the Lydian mode. In the Lydian mode. So this movement alone, perhaps, is the greatest. I don't want to say. I shouldn't say that because that's that's my perception. But it's a real, it's a real testament to, to to music that that maybe proves that there's something more in the universe. I think he achieved something in this in this movement in this piece that it, it, it's 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 sublime. Yeah, and it's a piece that. I don't think there's any other piece like it in the world, and certainly not in his time or even in his own oeuvre. It is extraordinary. Uh, not only is it in the Lydian mode and is using kind of an imagined Renaissance you're gonna, you harmony. Can't, you've, you can't, you've bandied that around too oh, much. Oh, too many Lydian define. mode. Define. Yeah, Lydian mode is just, uh, uh, if you play a scale on F on the piano. Yeah, and you don't use any of the black keys. You yeah. just start on F and you go, and you don't use any accent. Yeah. So the, the fourth is raised. So it's, it's really not. weird to do this. And in fact, that, that, the piece is weird as a result of that. But the key thing here, because I think we need to contrast this with the heroic style. What's happened here is that the music has, is, is no longer heroic. The music has, is, a, is a song of thanksgiving. So instead of that sense of independence, there's a, song, there's a sense, sense of dependency here. And you're gonna hear something that is, I don't know how to describe this because it's one of these ineffable moments where it's as if the heavens have opened, right, in, in some sense. It's an extraordinary feeling. Uh, and you mentioned the other day that, in fact, you couldn't get this movement out of your head for the last three years or something since that performance. Well, it's the proof, you know, sometimes when, when the music stops physically ringing, it doesn't stop ringing here ever. That this, this, this notion that things move you and just because you send the vibrations out doesn't necessarily mean the piece ends. And I think Beethoven really starts playing with that, this sort of the sense of the cosmos and the music of the spheres that maybe the order of the universe. I mean, he starts contemplating these things rather than maybe even these things like war and violence and, and hormones and, and, and even love and transcending into something that is, that is incomprehensible and intangible. Yeah, and it takes on this extraordinary stillness that is almost the complete opposite of the heroic style where it's you know, very concentrated. This is almost, it, it almost sort of keep, wants to keep going on forever and ever. It's 15 so, minutes long, right? So is, yeah. it, is, it, is, it, is it fair in, 
this is a half-baked thought, but is it fair? If we think of the heroic style and we think of the, the, the emergence of this music and the emergence of self uh, around 1803, 1802, 1803, this, is, this, is, is a, this is a movement that is this and out. And, and we had that break at, at the end of his middle period. There, there's, there's, there's a time of depression, perhaps. And now is is it now is it a retreat inside? Is it is the whole mentality moving to a completely? It certainly sounds like it for, for this piece. But I think when you're facing your own end, it does things to composers. It does things to people. I think when you, I mean, he almost died. I mean, basically, this is this is his. He recovered, and there's parts of this that we're not going to play today called the Neues Kraft. There's this new power where he he you can you can sense it. But maybe we should take a quick listen and then. This is the... This is the third section. Yeah. notion of um, the work that we do, the work that we've done with Camerata Pacifica, and, um, and that of chamber music, <coughs> um, the, the, the intimacy, the, 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 what, I, what I strive for with how we present music to you is to have us all come together as a community so that, that we can share these moments of intimacy that, that, that are transcendent beyond any one person. And you know, as a flute player, we do, I don't have anything like this. And, and I wonder, for you, we're talking about these late quartets. I think even for piano players, it's not the same thing. The, the idea of this string quartet and that communion that you have with your colleagues and, and this complete immersion in, in um, one sound. It's not a viola part, it's, it's, a, it's a one sound. I mean, that, these must be peak life experiences. It doesn't get better, yeah, it doesn't. We're lucky. Um, I think there are a few, we could come up with lists of works that really rip open the universe and you see, you see something great. But you know, it's, there, it's not without cost. I mean, it's really not without cost. And, and it is a privilege. You think about, that's a, what what he carried for all this discussion, what he what he the burden and the struggle. There are phrases that I use again 
what, what I'm talking about. And, and, and the notion, I think, which, which I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of this responsibility, and, and I've said it to you all because I think you're part of it too. You bear some of this responsibility that we're stewards of this art yeah, form. absolutely. And we have to hand it off in a better condition than and that we, we, ha we have to take care of this treasure and give it to the next generation more than it was. Yeah, I mean, you have to understand. I mean, Beethoven only wrote string quartets at the end of his life. He was commissioned to write three of them. He didn't have to write the other two. He felt that this was the, what he needed to communicate. So in a way, these quartets is a kind of summary of everything. So it's not just this piece of music. It's a whole complex uh, worlds of different music that is there. Uh, and it's, it's not really giving you any answers, but it's giving you all this extraordinary experience. And uh, if we don't pass it on, you are basically losing something that is uh, well, a, a, an unbelievable treasure and experience. But if you can try, it's trying to get people to get it, to understand it. So it's not that it's difficult to understand when you come to the hall to hear it, but to go really deep into it is the key thing because they're inexhaustible. At the start, we talked lightly about serious music and the fact that you go into the hall and you don't clap between movements. And, and, uh, and I think this is exactly why, because um, the, 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 I think, I think at its best, the, the, the music is a record of, of the human condition, of our commonness. And, and, I, and I think the, the live concert experience is, is you, you, have, you have the emotional content of the, of, of, of the composer, and it's brought to life by the, the emotional experience and your understanding as an interpreter. But, the, the critical third part of, of the Trinity is the reception and by your life experience. And, and, I, 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 and I love this thought and I live for this thought because when we're here and when we're in the moment, when, when, when you're on stage, it's a, it doesn't matter if it was written in 1808. Or, it's a contemporaneous experience. It's an experience of that moment that, that, is, that, that you, can, you can't get back. And I think in that moment, the, 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 the concert hall becomes a portal through, through which we're united in a continuum of, that's boundless. There, there's, there's no temporal or strength. It's the Giacometti quote, we're... great art is object because it ceases to be bound by time. I think I like that quote and I love Giacometti, but I think that's a very interesting thing that that yeah, there, there are a few things I think we seek as human, like, there are a lot of questions, there's more questions than there, it's all questions, but, but this whole notion of what is eternal, what lasts, um, I'd like to think maybe, maybe love lasts, I don't know, music? We're Thanks, talking about the- Thanksgiving. Gratitude? Yes, I Gratitude is love? <laughs> I don't know, I mean, I think this, this definitely is, uh, Jeremy Dank is a, a mutual friend of all of us, but I was talking to Jeremy about the, the, the late quartets and how much after this experience it moved me and I was like, it was, it was really, it was almost too much to bear. It was just, it, it was a lifetime of waiting and, and a lot of work to make this happen, but it was just so worth it and I'd do it again. I'd do it every day if I could. Um, and Jeremy's like, yeah, he really got it right. Maybe less on the night symphony. <laughs> I was like, Jeremy, how can you say something like that? But he said, yeah, in the quartets, he really got it right. <laughs> well, I think since we were just playing the, the Heidegger Danke song, I wanted to play another piece that is also extremely vulnerable. This is Beethoven at his rawest and uh, most open in a way, which is the, uh, the, what we call the beklempt section, because it's marked to beklempt in the cavatina from uh, Opus 130. Uh, and so we, I thought we'd, we'd play that, because you have a story about this when it was played in, in Korea, right? This particular uh, movement. Because the quartets don't quite evenly divide um, to make six full programs, a lot of quartets uh, find different solutions. So we played Opus 130. 
two times like it's going to be done at Camerata. The first time we performed 130 was on the first concert with the, the alternate finale, the last thing that Beethoven c composed and didn't even basically see, uh, see anybody perform. Uh, and then in that concert, um, uh, I think there is a woman that was so overcome she just, she just ran out of the hall because I think it's just the cavatina hits hard. Whereas the Heiliger Dankesang maybe takes about 15 minutes to unfold. The cavatina is a relatively short- It's very tight form. Like six minutes, six minutes and a half minutes. And it's, yeah, it's basically an ABA form. And this, this B section, the beklemt, it's not misspelled on this, but beklemt, maybe you could define be verklemt or beklemt. Kind of uh, constricted, you know, it's like, Highly emotional, uh, but you can. Uh, but in, in this, what happens in in this particular piece? Because it's a, the cavatina is an operatic form; it's an operatic song. But in the middle section, something extraordinary happens, where it, it seems like the first violinist can't really get the words out. It's like it's, it's, it's like kind of breakdown. The song cannot be sung. So there's this constant stuttering, and everything is not arriving on the right beat. So it's a highly emotive moment, uh, and it seems to be so vulnerable. Uh, this is, I, I wanted to play this because it's as if it's not, he basically is no longer, no longer just stripping away the materials, he's almost stripping him, uh, the way his soul, as it were. Uh, and this is the most anti-heroic you can get because it's almost embarrassing. In fact, a lot of scholars find it very difficult to talk about uh, this particular moment. So I think we should, we should play this because this is a very famous uh, moment in, in late Beethoven. into the song, and that's that moment. So that's, that's the moment when somebody decided to, couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's basically, it's, it's such a beautiful, so much of the piece is such, I think, I find 130 sort of a, it's, it's perhaps one of the harder ones to perform of the late quartets because the exposition movement is quite a, it's sort of a question. It's, you get the sort of establishment of B flat major is the key, but even this introduction, it's very enigmatic. Um, and then you get that scherzo, you heard the da da lum ba da la da 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 And then you get a very interesting little Rococo variation movement, uh, which is really, really kind of... It's a like little, a beautiful piece of clockwork. Yeah, it's like a jewelry box. <laughs> yes. And, and then, then the fourth movement is, is, is something lifted from 132, the Alla Tedesca. The di da dum pa di 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 dum pa da. And then you get this movement, the Cavatina, which is really many, when I was first studying this when I was a kid, the, the same coach that I coached by 132 is like, this is, he said, this, is, this movement's very special, something you'll understand. Um, and it's, it's really tears. I think Beethoven, what was Beethoven's definition is like he... Well, according to uh, Karl Holtz, who uh, kind of helped Beethoven a lot in his uh, later life, uh, you know, Beethoven wept tears uh, writing this particular movement. So this is why I said this is really Beethoven sort of, uh, sort of bearing himself, really. Uh, and it's one of these pieces where you just feel vulnerability, you know, up front. Yeah. Just to describe, you know, the, those triplet motions, we go into... It's the whole movement's basically been a nice, very flowing three, and all of a sudden you get these these triplets that depart to is it um, just G flat or well, it's it's like we've been in B flat major and now we were drifting in. I can't remember. <laughs> to some obscure into the maybe G flat uh, uh, G flat minor. Or it's very very strange, and the, and because the violin is all mm, da 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 da, and and he writes it. It's sort of like almost as you've described. It's like he can't breathe. He's just he, he's he's overwhelmed. It's almost yeah. It's and it's it's just, there's all these yeah like it's it like these these fragments, and then and this moment we have arrived here in the music, it recapitulates, and and I think it's just. That sh it's, a sh it's so shocking. It's really shocking. 
It's a shocker. And, then, and then what I wanted to bring out was that you know, we've been playing these two, you know, the Halika Dankasang and this Cavatina. Uh, it, it's one aspect of Beethoven, but Beethoven does not give you any easy answers in the late quartets. And uh, this, this particular quartet, the next movement, is probably the most violent and difficult movement in the late quartet. So it, it ends so beautifully. And then you get the most horrendous G from the Grosse Fugue is as if he's kind of just plunging a knife into the cavatina and then he's going to twist it like this mm. and like this and like this. And you have this uh, fugue, which maybe we should play this because it, it, it's, it's one of these. Um, I don't think we, we haven't. Got I think we, we, we do have it. You want that? We did, just to, yeah, we, we, we should play it because Beethoven basically wrote th three fugues that, that are kind of against the grain of what fugues should be. Most fugues should show a kind of harmony of, of counterpoint. It's kind of expression of the great cosmos out, out there, or sometimes an expression of social cohesion. But these three fugues in the Hammer Clavier Piano Sonata, the last movement, in the Donna Nobis Parchem of his Mrs. Solemnis and this Grosse Fugue are like fugues that are deliberately trying to pull things apart. It's as if he's trying to make it not work. So everything gets kind of out of proportion or out of kilter. And so it sounds extraordinarily dissonant and violent. And it begins like this. So you've just had the cavatina, this most beautiful thing. And then it comes in like uh, with this. As a, in, uh, a long introduction. But the, the point is, you know, we, we're now entering into a very different territory where, you know, you thought the cavatina was a kind of answer. Well, <laughs> here's the Grosse Fuga. And you can imagine the contrast. The first audience, you know, they, they said, what is this? You, know, how, that, you can imagine why they said, maybe you shouldn't have this as the last movement, you know, because it's, uh, about, how long is this, a 15 minute fugue? I think it goes, yeah, from somewhere between 13 and 15 minutes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and, and relatively speaking, the, the, most of the movements of 130 have been relatively bite-sized compared to, let's say, 132. They're, they're shorter, yeah, they're short. shorter like movements, suite. like little, yeah, it's like a suite. And all of a sudden you have this, is, this is the, the totality, this is the solution to the piece. This is the resolution of the piece being this, and you're like, am I on another planet? It's, it's, I think it's, until the very, basically to the coda, you don't really, you're, you're returning your cadencing in B flat until he, he puts it all together and then the light goes on, it's like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, basically at the end, he shows you, actually it really does work, and everything works really harmoniously, but it comes right at the end, so the victory sounds a little bit hollow. Yes. You know, after all that dissonance and actually considerable violence to the players too, yes. um, that you, know, you have this thing. And this is one of the issues about the late quartets. You do have heroic moments, but they're always problematic. They're never satisfactory. It's always a question rather than a, an assertion of victory of some kind. And, and that's, that's, that's the growth of you. So we're closing the season with Beethoven's arrangements of Irish folk songs. <laughs> you have to get the Irish in there. <laughs> Not only that, Northern Irish. The return to Ulster. Um, and then Opus 130 but with the alternate ending. Right. Should you just play this? The, the, so, so after he was sort of asked to write something else, this is the alternate reality. It's sort of a movie with a second ending. And this, this ending is quite different. So you still have the, the G, but it's 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 basically oh, da, 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 yeah. the, the big dominant. Da, 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 da. So it's 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 a, it's I, I I actually love this movie. It's a great movement. Actually. It's it's really brilliant. But it's now in the shadow of the Grosse Fuga. But you must remember, nobody played the Grosse Fuga. They played this, this movement was the only for thing most of was, the 19th yeah, century. Most of most of the world for a large large part of New 130 is this. 
was the resolution. But that's the interesting thing, because you know, it's, it's, this quartet has two endings that are completely different, and it has a completely different character to the quartets. And some people, you know, like Stravinsky prefers one, and other people think, oh my gosh, you know, it, it really doesn't work, it's overwhelming, right? It does really weight the program very heavily to end, it, it adds, you know, a, a disproportionate amount of weight. One solution we've done in, in concerts is to do 130, 133, it has its own um, uh, opus number, the Grosse Fuga, and then as an encore, do this. So no, the, this, this alternate ending, the, the little ditty, ditty, that was yeah. the last piece that Beethoven wrote. That was his final composition. Yeah, it's kind of amazing to me. But you know, I mean, just talking about that, because we were just talking about this, uh, that if you think about the last pieces that he wrote, so it's the Opus 135, that, that last, uh, the, the, uh, the string quartet Opus 135. Um, again, it's a completely different mood, right? It's not the Cavatina or the Halika Dankazang. It's not the Grosse Fugue. It's a little bit like that, um, uh, the, the, the alternative finale, where there is a kind of uh, humor or irony in Beethoven that, uh, that kind of winks at you. Because um, the last movement, that we maybe can, we should play this in a moment, the last movement is, is the only one where there is a kind, some words, a kind of epitaph, right? Oh, up yes. There. And, you know, you want to talk a little, bit, a little bit about this? Well, you, was it October or November? Or December? December. When we when Opus 135 with the Calders, you probably were there. It's, it, it, yeah, there's the, 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 the hard de schwer, um, the, the very heavy, he heavy uh, kind of uh, question. question, very difficult and decision. This, that you have yeah, to make. and it's like, and in the in the score, above all the parts, the first, the only time there's words with notes on the, it's like a uh, moose as sign. Must it be? Must it be? And then right after it, as moose sign. So it's it's sort of you. you it's sort of this. This is this is a whole discussion yeah. topic. Is is it a serious question or is it is it a nothing question? Should I pay my rent? Is it what's what's you know? Should I? I mean, he sets it up as if it's a heavy philosophical question, right? Must it be? It must. It's about being an ontology and whatever, right? Uh, but actually, the story behind it is is because somebody didn't pay for the subscription. Yeah, the subscription. Uh, so it's like pay up, man. So pay up. <laughs> must it be? It must be pay up. Yeah, yeah pay, pay up, up me. Anyway, but yeah. so, so it's kind of joke. But it, it begins very very. I mean. Talk about serious music, very seriously. Yeah. You know, you talk about the Hagen Quartet playing it it's extremely seriously. Some some quartets play some things Ponticello. Although I, I disagree with because he's very specific when he writes Ponticello. It's only basically in 131 he actually notates. But some people really the the, the famous and wonderful one of my favorite quartets, the Hagen Quartet. Um, they really they play almost with no vibrato and, and at the bridge and it scratches and it grates. Must it be? It must it be? Yeah, and, it, and it's very frightening. But I think we have an excerpt of. You know, we're but talking this about, is how it ends. This is this is the ending. <laughs> this is an ending of it all. I mean, basically, the last thing. So you will hear the the question. You know, must it be? It must be. It must be. And then the answer. This is the answer. This is a little bit of the, of the question, and then the answer. <laughs> A metaphysical deflation. <laughs> it's like a twittering bird, a mechanical twittering bird at the end. So you see, there's, there's a side of Beethoven, and this is really, you know, uh, the, the last of the late quartets that is far more ironic and witty uh, and puts a big smile on things. I think what you're saying of all these quartets that they're uh, defying categorization. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so, there's so many different styles and experiences in these late quartets. I, I always say it's not really a late style, it's late styles, it's almost like that. And I think um, if you're looking for, for a single answer from the late quartets, you won't get one. I always think of this from the sublime to the ridiculous and perhaps back to the sublime. I think he balances out 
the mood so well because if it was, I think there's something about the, you could have the most profound heart-wrenching moment and then he'll just like, it, he'll just dispel it. And I think that's just, that it's magic to me as a, as, as, as for, for audiences too, I think that just, it's such a great contrast that it's not just, I think maybe 130, even 131 as a composition has, it's, it's, it's C sharp minor and it's, it's through composed and it's, it's intense, but it, it, it has such great variety. Variety, amazing. Variety of, of human experience. Well, I don't want to, that's projecting. It, it has such variety. Um, and, and this quartet too, even, even this movement ends very, sort of as you saw with pizzicato and, and ha ha ha, <laughs> and like I told you so. But um, uh, the movement before this um, is uh, of four statements, basically variation form, and, and was sketched to end 131. There at the end, in his sketches of 131, the theme of this slow movement was was to tie one thirty one to talk about altered endings. There's a sketch of him where he sketches this slow movement from this, which is really profound. And I think, in perhaps perhaps it delves deepest, um, even though it's incredibly concise. Yeah. It delves pretty. It, it goes into darkness for a, a just a, frac a little bit of time. It's one of those moments that only a Beethoven can do because it's the simplest, simplest of themes. It's almost like a scale. It's like a Tchaikovsky <laughs> melody. It's like... I mean, that's, that's it, it. Yeah. right? But he, it becomes absolutely sublime. And that is the magic of Beethoven. This has a question mark, but I don't believe it's a question. Tchaikovsky and Strauss told stories with, their, with music, Mozart, Bach collected musical details into a whole Beethoven heroic, common, or describe the indescribable, how can we see his music as anything but serious? And there's a question mark, but I think maybe it was meant to be an exclamation mark. Well, we just played something that was seriously funny. It was, uh, <laughs> it was anything but serious. It's or well, relative uh, victory over, over yeah, Waterloo. I mean, it's serious, but it's witty, right? So, I mean, there, there, as long as the seriousness is not just that scowl that we saw, you know, that, that kind of uh, overbearing look. Uh, there, there is a Beethoven that is much lighter. So, and fact, this, the, then there's Milan another Kondoros. card. So that, yeah. I'm going to put all these, uh, that together. So with Beethoven, how can we see it as anything but serious? Another person here says, one word for these quartets is sacred. Mm. And then the question is, which is interesting, would Beethoven talk about the heroic in his music as you have? He, Beethoven didn't talk a lot about his music, interestingly, about it. He does talk about freedom once uh, in one of his letters. So th there is a sense in which that, that uh, concept of uh, hu human autonomy uh, is, is there. He's, he's basically saying that the whole world and the human uh, being is, is moving towards freedom. That's what it's about, and progress and freedom. Um, so there is that sense that he captures that. Um, you don't really need to... Uh, I think you get what's happening in the Eroica and the Fifth Symphony. You, you, you have that sense in which the music is driving towards these goals. Uh, I think the key thing here is not whether Beethoven validates it, really. I, I, uh, you know, you're putting things in a particular context, but we know for sure that uh, the people talking about Beethoven kind of felt that and kind of knew that. Uh, the Eroica was regarded as, for many commentators, as even though it was written in 1803, as the beginning of the 19th century. This is the new art epoch of, of freedom. So in that sense, it did the heroic work that it was supposed to do. And we talked a little bit about A.B. Marx earlier. So A.B. Marx could hear in Beethoven this freedom as a kind of internal movement of the will. In other words, it's not like you know, you, you're painting some external form here. It's as if the music is moving internally and it's driving towards these cadences. And, and so it's, if you remember those uh, uh, very hunky men in those uh, French revolutionary paintings, it's as if that internal energy 
is inside these forms, right? these muscular forms. So in, in that sense, I think we can say that that, that, that reception of the hero, heroic is early on, and there is some registering of that in, in Beethoven. But I, the way we talk about it today, it's obviously a huge scholarly yeah, tradition. Don't be, don't be, yeah, don't be dragging me in with you, man. It's like <laughs> you brought it up. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for traveling from Hong Kong. Oh, it's a pleasure. Here. Thank you very much for traveling from Santa Monica, Mr. Lee. Ha, ha, ha.